After the execution of the evacuation strategy on the dungeon's first floor by Cabru and the Canaries, including their clash with the Mad Sorcerer, the narrative shifts focus back to Laios and his companions. This arc promises an in-depth exploration of the characters, shedding light on their profound aspirations and motivations for venturing into the dungeon. Get ready to delve into the remnants of a dwarf city, where the journey will be enriched with more encounters with fascinating beings and an array of exquisite culinary experiences. Following their return to their original forms, the group sat down for breakfast. During the meal, Marcel expressed curiosity about Chilchuk's wife, inquiring whether she leaned towards being traditionally beautiful or possessed a charming cuteness. She probed further into the nature of their relationship, questioning what aspects made Chilchuk fall in love with her, how their paths first crossed, their terms of endearment, and the details of his marriage proposal. Overwhelmed by her barrage of questions, Chilchuk implored her to cease her inquiries. He disclosed that they were now estranged, attributing the separation to his infidelity and sternly requested she refrain from broaching the subject further, indicating his reluctance to discuss the matter. This revelation led the other party members to view Chilchuk unfavorably for his act of betrayal. Chilchuk harbors a profound disdain for the notion of pursuing love purely for its own sake. His extensive experience as a dungeon explorer has taught him that romantic entanglements among adventurers pose the greatest risk to the cohesion of a party. He has observed firsthand how the dissolution of relationships, built upon the trials and triumphs shared by the group, can leave a lasting bitterness. Indeed, Laios's party has not been immune to such turmoil. However, the party had recently enjoyed a respite from such dramas, though Marcel's heightened curiosity, sparked by discussions of love confessions, tested Chilchuk's patience. Marcel's inquiries revealed that both Farlin and Laios had previously been engaged, though neither commitment came to fruition. As their journey continued, they marveled at the remnants of an ancient dwarven city, speculating on the dwarves' mode of transportation via trolleys and the potential hazards of ambushes from above. Since she remarked on the inevitability of combat, noting their dwindling meat supply and suggesting it was time to hunt, Laios anticipated encountering rats, a prospect Azutsumi found distasteful, proposing they consider an alternative she spotted nearby. Upon closer inspection, Laios mistook it for a cow before recognizing it as a bicorn, known for its disdain for virtue in contrast to the purity-associated unicorns. He reflected on the subjective nature of virtue, pondering its definition. When Marcel suggested employing explosion magic, Laios dismissed the idea, preferring a stealthier approach to subduing their quarry. Upon their discovery, the bicorn cast a glance in their direction. Laios couldn't help but admire its majestic appearance, though Marcel observed that it seemed disinterested in them. This was peculiar to Laios, given their understanding of bicorns as typically aggressive creatures. He pondered the necessity of enticing it with corruption, given that pure young maidens were traditionally bait for unicorns. Thus, by logic, a corrupt adult male would be the lure for a bicorn. This led their gazes to fall upon Chilchuk, who questioned why he was the chosen candidate. Undeterred, Laios decided to approach the bicorn himself. As he tiptoed closer, offering a greeting, the bicorn bolted, prompting Laios to question his own level of corruption. Faced with no alternative, Laios concluded that they must engage in corrupt acts themselves. He listed several sinful behaviors, envy, greed, pride, sloth, infidelity, wrath, and gluttony, as potential means to attract the bicorn's attention. Opting to begin with gluttony, they found themselves indulging in the crunchy texture of a mushroom sandwich, vigorously consuming it in hopes of drawing the creature's interest. Since she remarked that they had just eaten breakfast, to which Laios retorted, highlighting the act of eating again as an exemplification of gluttony. Marcel chimed in, praising the deliciousness of the grilled mushrooms, comparing their savory taste to bacon. Since she suggested adding a touch of syrup to enhance the flavor, a combination that took Marcel by surprise due to its unexpected harmony. 
She encouraged Chilchuk to sample the concoction, but he declined, expressing his distaste for sweetening savory dishes. Chilchuk defended his preference by arguing that sweets should be reserved for snacks, implying that their palates must be flawed. At that moment, Lyos observed the bicorn's interest in their direction, signaling the success of his strategy. Moving on to the sin of envy, he queried the group about their jealousies. Chilchuk admitted his envy towards Senchi, lamenting that a more formidable appearance might have spared him from disdain in the past. Senchi, in turn, expressed his envy of Chilchuk's acute sensory perceptions, believing that such traits would have significantly enriched his experiences. Marcel noted Senchi's candidness in such discussions. Lyos then addressed the bicorn, confessing his envy towards quadrupedal monsters, expressing a wish he had been born as one himself. Observing Azutsumi's disinterest, leading her to opt for sleep over participation, the group jubilantly declared her action as embodying sloth, excitedly acknowledging it as part of their plan. The challenge of exemplifying pride led Lyos to query the group on how they might manifest such a trait. Chilchuk suggested that Marcel would find this task straightforward, hinting at her as the embodiment of pride, especially given her tendency to boast about her intelligence. This suggestion left Marcel taken aback, surprised by Chilchuk's portrayal of her. Marcel questioned the fairness of being the target of jokes, particularly when they seemed to belittle her. Her irritation quickly escalated, pointing out Chilchuk's sensitivity to any hint of discrimination against him, contrasting sharply with his apparent apathy towards his biases. This shift in Marcel's demeanor concerned Chilchuk, while Lyos, observing the change, jubilantly acknowledged their success in provoking Marcel's ire. With the bicorn now stationary, Lyos sensed they were on the verge of achieving their goal and declared he would embody greed himself. He brazenly expressed his desire to the bicorn, coveting its meat, horns, and all it could offer. However, his blatant greed caused the bicorn to evade and escape, leaving Layos to lament their near success. The final sin, infidelity, remained, and Layos unexpectedly passed this task to Chilchuk, who was taken aback, wondering why he was chosen for this role. Lyos explained the choice of Chilchuk for the task of infidelity was due to his history of being abandoned by his wife after committing adultery, making him the group's sole member with first-hand experience in such matters. Despite Chilchuk's initial confusion and reluctance, he acquiesced to the plan. Lyos instructed that once the bicorn lowered its head, Chilchuk should ensnare it with a rope. As Chilchuk cautiously approached the bicorn, Lyos watched filled with hope. To Chilchuk's astonishment, the bicorn appeared to smile at him before suddenly biting his arm and violently shaking him. The scene alarmed the rest of the party, prompting Azutsumi to strike the bicorn with her weapon. The impact to its head forced the bicorn to release Chilchuk. Lyos then charged, tackling the bicorn to the ground. Since she directed Azutsumi to secure the rope around the bicorn, tossing the other end to Lyos. He adeptly fastened it around the bicorn's leg and horn. With the creature effectively restrained, the group collectively exerted force, successfully subduing the bicorn. The group struggled against the bicorn, which emitted whines of distress. Izatsumi secured the rope, aiding in their effort to subdue the creature. At Lyoza's command, they united for a final tug, successfully bringing the bicorn to the ground, thereby capturing it. Lyos offered an apology to the beast before drawing his sword across it. Meanwhile, Chilchuk sustained serious injuries, and when Marcel inquired about his condition, he sarcastically questioned if he appeared all right to her. Marcel promptly offered to heal him. Lyos expressed regret over overlooking the fact that bicorns sometimes consume humans, a detail that baffled Chilchuk given its critical nature. Lyos elaborated on a theory suggesting bicorns prey specifically on virtuous husbands, which, he joked, should technically exempt Chilchuk due to his estrangement from his wife caused by alleged infidelity. Marcel, noticing Chilchuk's reaction to this theory, pressed him for clarity. Amidst his agony, Chilchuk pleaded for a slower healing process, hoping to use the opportunity to confess. 
He clarified he had not been unfaithful, but had claimed so to maintain his dignity before them. He confessed his bewilderment regarding the true reasons behind his wife's departure. Chilchuk recounted an occasion from the past when his colleagues expressed a desire to meet his wife, leading to a shared meal. However, the evening took a sour turn as she became visibly upset on their way home, and by the time Chilchuk returned from his subsequent assignment, she had already left. Marcel responded to his story with empathy, deeming his wife's departure without explanation both harsh and unfair. She inquired about his wife's well-being, to which Chilchuk assured her there was no cause for concern, mentioning he had received correspondence from the individual who had taken her in. Chilchuk confessed his frustration over the situation had prevented any further communication between them. Marcel speculated that being Chilchuk's wife, burdened with the uncertainty of his return and the daily worries for his safety, would have been incredibly stressful. She imagined the strain of managing household duties and caring for their child in his absence. She suggested that Chilchuk's reticence about his adventures, coupled with his occasional return bearing grave injuries, would naturally lead his wife to wish for him to pursue a less perilous profession. Nonetheless, Marcel concluded that she would likely find a degree of satisfaction in their shared life, despite its challenges. Chilchuk expressed surprise that Marcel had accurately conjectured the entire narrative. Marcel expanded on her hypothesis, suggesting that upon learning of an opportunity to meet Chilchuk's colleagues, his wife would have been thrilled. She would have arranged childcare and chosen her attire with great care, all the while Chilchuk might fuss over their potential tardiness. This first encounter with his work associates would be significant for her, assuming that Chilchuk's willingness to make introductions indicated his high regard for them. The prospect of enjoying a delightful meal outside their home, coupled with the compliments from Chilchuk's friends, would fill her with joy. Yet, it would also offer her insight into how Chilchuk represented her in their conversations. Knowing Chilchuk's reserved nature, she understood he might not openly express his love for her, despite his deep feelings. However, during this gathering, after indulging in a few drinks, she would observe him interacting with his attractive female friends. His easy camaraderie and the warmth of his smiles directed at them would contrast with her own perception of herself as uninteresting. Marcel speculated further, suggesting that his wife, for the first time, would doubt his affection. Aware that direct questions would remain unanswered, she would ultimately choose to leave as a means of testing his love. Marcel envisioned this sequence of events as the underlying cause of the situation. Izatsumi and Laios were captivated by her detailed narrative, which seemed as though she had witnessed the events firsthand. Marcel queried Chilchuk on whether his initial disclosure of being married was intended to avert complications with his peers, but following the unexpected turn of events, he resolved to keep his personal life private henceforth. Chilchuk was astounded by Marcel's accurate conjecture. Marcel clarified she had no specific knowledge of his situation, but pointed out that such scenarios are commonly depicted in stories and gossip. Observing Chilchuk's accidental dropping of his sandwich, she emphasized the importance of replenishing his energy due to the blood loss, offering him her sandwich instead. Chilchuk gratefully accepted and upon tasting it, inquired if it was the one containing syrup. His reaction to the flavor was surprisingly positive, leading him to acknowledge that perhaps he had been too quick to judge the combination earlier. Laios observed that the bicorn's aggression towards Chilchuk might indicate his recognition as a virtuous husband, prompting him to question if fidelity alone defines such virtue. Marcel responded, clarifying that while fidelity is a component, Chilchuk's virtue is undeniable. When Laios inquired about her interpretation of virtuous, Marcel explained that virtue's essence is too complex for a brief explanation. She offered to lend them books on the subject, encouraging them to delve into the nuances of human emotions and virtues. Furthermore, Marcel advised Chilchuk to buy flowers and visit his wife once he returns to the surface, suggesting that such a gesture would likely delight her. She humorously added that having received the Bicorn's endorsement, Chilchuk should feel encouraged by this sign of approval. Although Chilchuk concurred with the plan, 
He expressed uncertainty about whether life's outcomes could mirror the optimistic resolutions found in stories. Marcel queried about the age of Chilchuk's daughter, speculating on her eagerness to reunite with her father. Chilchuk, bursting into laughter at Marcel's speculation, corrected her with the revelation that his daughter is already grown and living independently. Marcel was astounded by this, especially upon learning that all three of his children were adults, a fact that took her by complete surprise. Laios, curious about cultural differences, asked at what age halflings reach adulthood, to which Chilchuk replied it is around 14 in his region, while Laios noted it's 16 where he comes from. Marcel remarked on the rapid progression of their life stages. Chilchuk disclosed that the assurance of his wife's safety was communicated through a letter from his daughter, who also sent his neckband, indicating that his wife now resides with their second daughter. Marcel, showing concern, inquired if Chilchuk had more secrets, to which he insisted there were none. Nevertheless, Marcel was determined, vowing to coax out any remaining undisclosed details from him. The narrative shifts to a moment where Marcel's worried expression deeply concerns Laios. Unable to grasp the situation and perplexed by Marcel's somber demeanor, Laios reminisces about their initial encounter. He observes that Marcel, once consistently stoic, has become significantly more expressive over time. Laios confesses his unease behind her unsettling look. This segues into a flashback featuring Farlin questioning Laios about his attire for an upcoming meeting. Surprised, Laios wonders if his appearance is unsatisfactory. Farlin critiques his choice, emphasizing the need for grooming and dressing in his finest attire, which Laios believed he had done. Realizing her oversight due to being preoccupied with tidying, Farlin assists Laios in styling his hair. She explains the importance of the encounter, describing the individual they are to meet as not only her friend and mentor, but also someone possessing a strict demeanor alongside kindness and fascination. Laios acknowledges the advice to approach her with the utmost respect. Farlin further reveals her friend's current displeasure, attributing it to a misperception of her own age and a belief that Laios had inappropriately whisked Farlin away, leaving Laios in disbelief. Laios expressed curiosity about the reasons motivating such an esteemed individual to pursue adventuring. Farlin explained her friend's dedication to studying ancient magic, pointing out the dungeon's abundance of such magic as her primary research interest. As Laios prepared himself, he reflected on the typical dynamic between researchers and adventurers, noting it's unusual for someone like her, an elf with no adventuring experience, to join an expedition directly. He shared his concerns with his companions, highlighting apprehensions about her lack of exploration skills and questioning the relevance of her magical knowledge in the dungeon's challenging environment. Laios was particularly concerned about her combat capabilities, given the absence of combat spell training in her education. Far Lin, however, reassured him, confident that her friend Marcel wouldn't face issues in that regard. Awaiting at a restaurant, Laios pondered over his impending interaction with Marcel. Far Lin had decided to meet her at the port alone, planning to introduce her to Laios subsequently. As he waited, Laios, about to engage in his first conversation with an elf, mused over their longevity and the unique perspectives it might bring to their quest. A hooded woman accidentally dropped an envelope on Laios' table, which he promptly returned. Grateful, she inquired about Far Lin, described with light brown hair and amber eyes, from a restaurant staff member who indicated that only Farlin's older brother, Laios, was present. Upon introduction, Laios greeted her warmly, but her demeanor quickly shifted to one of anger as she accused him of abducting Far Lin. Farlin intervened, correcting the misunderstanding and admitting her mistake in the rendezvous location. Marcel, relieved to reunite with Far Lin after what she believed to be three years, was corrected by Marcel stating it had been four. Marcel expressed her concern for Far Lin's well-being and criticized her for not considering her future, urging her to abandon her dungeon exploration plans. Despite Far Lin's protests and explanation of her passion for dungeon exploration, Marcel was adamant about taking her back to the academy, citing Far Lin's disheveled appearance as a deciding factor. 
Marcel stated she would extend her apologies to everyone, insisting on their return by the next ship. Farlin seemed uncertain, prompting Layos to propose a single expedition into the dungeon for Marcel. He reasoned that since she had traveled all this way, she should at least witness the dungeon's environment firsthand. He believed that understanding their daily experiences within the dungeon might alleviate some of her concerns. Upon entering the dungeon, Marcel acknowledged her previous dungeon encounters, but noted this was her first experience in a living, artificial dungeon. Lyos queried the concept of dungeons being either alive or dead, showcasing his curiosity. With the first level posing minimal danger, they proceeded to guide her through. In a private moment with Farlin, Lyos outlined a plan to demonstrate their competence to Marcel. He suggested that encountering trouble in the unfamiliar dungeon setting would provide them with an opportunity to rescue Marcel, thereby proving their worth as adventurers. Farlin admired her brother's clever strategy. Lyos seized the moment when a walking mushroom appeared, seeing it as a perfect teaching moment. They cautioned Marcel to stay back and let them handle it, yet Marcel confidently wielded her staff, unleashing a powerful explosive spell. She was amazed by the potency of her magic within the dungeon, suggesting that its effectiveness in warfare now made sense to her. Lyos, puzzled, questioned Farlin about Marcel's apparent lack of dungeon experience. Farlin clarified that although Marcel hadn't physically explored dungeons, she had dedicated decades to studying relevant magic and strategies. This led Lyos to ponder Marcel's age. As their exploration continued, both siblings were taken aback by Marcel's boldness in navigating the dungeon. Realizing their plan had not unfolded as expected, they faced Marcel's inquiry about their fervent desire to delve into the dungeon. Recognizing her challenge to their commitment, Farlin asserted that dungeon exploration offered invaluable practical experience beyond what books could provide. Marcel questioned the applicability of such skills on the surface, highlighting the school's avoidance of combat magic to protect students from persecution. Nonetheless, the siblings argued that their adventures had allowed them to forge significant relationships, countering Marcel's suggestion that more meaningful connections could be established above ground. Farlin reassured them about the financial stability their chosen profession offers, with Lyos chiming in about the wealth to be found in the dungeon's deeper levels, where gold lines the walls. This led Marcel to deduce that resources in the upper levels are dwindling, making the effort invested increasingly disproportionate to the rewards reaped. The Thornton siblings felt uneasy, pondering if honesty about their situation would serve them better. However, Lyos resisted this idea, fearing it would only serve to reinforce Marcel's perception of their motives as trivial. Farlin suspected that Marcel would see through their attempts to appear more serious about their endeavor soon enough. During their exploration, a slime unexpectedly landed on Lyos, enveloping his head until they used fire to drive it off. Lyos acknowledged his oversight, especially knowing the area was prone to slime infestations. Their attention quickly shifted to Marcel, who was found lying motionless on the ground. Approaching her, Farlin optimistically stated she could revive her, while Lyos wondered if a slime attack had caused her to lose consciousness. After Farlin successfully revived Marcel, she awoke confused, questioning if she had died. Farlin explained that Marcel was only momentarily deceased, with Lyos clarifying that her soul hadn't departed, likening her state more to unconsciousness than actual death. Marcel lowered her gaze, whispering something that intrigued the siblings. When she lifted her head, her expression of wonder caught them off guard. She confessed she had heard tales of such phenomena, but remained skeptical until witnessing them firsthand. The possibility of harnessing ancient magic to fulfill her aspirations amazed her. Her evident delight took the siblings by surprise. Lyos revealed their true motivation for venturing into the dungeon was rooted in curiosity and a desire to uncover its secrets. They were drawn to the thrill of discovering remnants of ancient civilizations, magic, and unknown creatures. He explained their quest was for knowledge and adventure, seeking like-minded individuals to join them. He then extended an invitation to Marcel to become their companion in exploration. 
After a moment of consideration, Marcel accepted with a handshake and a smile. Lyos found himself pondering what Marcel's ultimate dream might be. Reflecting on the whirlwind of events that had unfolded over the past year, Lyos found himself caught in a stream of memories. He couldn't help but wonder why recollections of his past were surfacing with such clarity, leading him to the unsettling realization that he was, for some inexplicable reason, teetering on the brink of death. His life's moments were unraveling before his eyes, prompting a desperate need to delve deeper into these memories for answers. He remembered Sinchi's suggestion to butcher the bicorn and their struggle to haul it into a dwelling that seemed designed for dwarves. However, Lyoza's reverie was abruptly interrupted when he had to retrieve something he had left behind, only to encounter an enormous, headless suit of armor wielding a whip. The sight of the animated armor filled him with dread, and he urgently warned his companions to flee, recognizing the entity as a spirit against which their weapons would prove futile. Despite his dire situation, Lyos appreciated his friend's swift compliance with his command to escape, leaving him alone to confront the spectral adversary. In a bid for his life, Lyos proposed a bargain, offering the bicorn as a trade for his safety hoping to appease the spirit's unknown desires. Consequently, the armored figure, after receiving the decapitated bicorn, untied it and mounted it. In adherence to their agreement, he left Lyos unharmed in exchange for the bicorn. Despite a minor mishap involving a door, the figure successfully departed. The companions quickly regrouped and were relieved to find Lyos alive. Chilchuk observed that the figure had mounted the horse and made its exit. Marcel, bewildered, inquired about Lyos's actions. Lyos explained that their visitor was a Dullahan, a spirit of a headless knight often associated with death. However, it intrigued him that this particular Dullahan was afoot. Thus, he proposed an offer. His life in exchange for providing it with a mount. Marcel was astonished by the Dullahan's acceptance of the deal. Lyos reasoned that the bicorn, being headless and deceased like the Dullahan, would be appealing to it. He expressed regret over the turn of events, acknowledging the group's efforts in capturing the bicorn. Nonetheless, Marcel, overcome with laughter, dismissed the concern, suggesting that they could simply capture another one. She remarked on their fortunate escape emphasizing the value of their lives over the loss. Lyos expressed a curiosity he had been harboring towards Marcel. While she was assisting him out of his armor, he broached the subject of her age. Marcel, taken aback by the unexpected inquiry, reciprocated the question, wondering how old he presumed she was. Izutsumi jokingly guessed she was 20,000 years old, but Marcel clarified she was directing the question at Lyos. He mentioned that, for reasons unknown, he had always pegged her to be around 100 years old. This assumption led him to question why she attended the same academy as Far Lin, given it predominantly catered to gnomes or humans who would be significantly younger than her, potentially creating a vast disparity in their scholastic aptitude. Marcel clarified that her role at the academy was not as a student but as a researcher, alongside handling various tasks assigned by the institution. Lyos pondered why Marcel, a mage of considerable skill, did not pursue her studies in the western regions, known for their elven population. Marcel's response was straightforward. She was native to the area, thus opting for a location within proximity. She did, however, occasionally venture to the west. As Lyos and Marcel were engaged in conversation, since she announced that Lyos was in for a special meal, the bicorn had left behind a remarkable ingredient for their dinner, the stewed head of the Dullahan's steed. Lyos expressed excitement upon seeing the bicorn's head, since she proposed starting with a gentle parboiling, using the cheek meat and tongue for a stew, and making a light soup from the eyes and brain. This suggestion piqued Lyos's interest, although Senshi noted their current lack of alternative ingredients. Marcel, on the other hand, was distraught at the thought revealing her lack of experience with consuming a horse's head. Lyos reassured her, suggesting it as an opportunity to expand her culinary knowledge, which only seemed to deepen her dismay. Observing her initial reaction, 
Lyos contemplated how, despite her initial resistance, Marcel often ended up enjoying the experience. Lyos himself looked forward to the meal, while Marcel hesitated at the prospect of consuming brain. Lyos and his companions stumbled upon remnants of a camp deep within the dungeon, sparking curiosity about the presence of others in such depths. This could indicate the presence of orcs, adventurers, or even remnants of ancient inhabitants, considering the similarities to what they had observed near the door. Chilchuk speculated whether the same individuals who left these signs were trailing them since they opened the door, suggesting they might still be in proximity. Marcel, expressing exhaustion, proposed postponing any decision until after some rest, a suggestion Lyos accepted. Azutsumi, visibly frustrated, lamented the repetitive cycle of eating and resting, questioning when they would reach the dungeon's bottom or find the winged lion to lift her curse. Chilchuk, addressing her self-centeredness, emphasized the importance of considering others and the interdependence among individuals. He challenged her notion of solitude, asserting that no one lives entirely independently. Izutsumi countered, claiming she had lived alone her entire life. Standing defiantly, she insisted no one had raised her, a statement Chilchuk disputed, believing someone must have cared for her. Izutsumi maintained that she had lived independently her entire life and intended to continue doing so. Chilchuk, probing further, inquired about her reason for joining them, to which Izutsumi replied that it was in pursuit of a potential cure for her curse, supposedly known by the mad sorcerer. Chilchuk suggested she could have sought out the sorcerer alone for a quicker resolution, highlighting her need for their assistance despite her claims of independence. After their exchange, Izutsumi moved towards where Sinchi was supposed to be, only to find his pot unattended. Her search led her to discover Sinchi in a concerning state, prompting her to alert the rest of the group. They found Sinchi with a withered appearance and a blissful expression, which Laios identified as symptoms of a succubus encounter. Succubi are known to allure their victims and drain their life essence while secreting a fluid that induces intense pleasure. Due to the value of this fluid, succubi often become targets for those seeking to exploit its effects. Laios had believed that all succubi had been eradicated from the dungeon. However, Izutsumi expressed skepticism about their threat level. Laios emphasized the impossibility of defeating them single-handedly, cautioning everyone against wandering alone. He then recalled that succubi are fond of milk and hastily left to find some, believing that placing milk beside their pillows could prevent attacks. Concerned about Laios venturing off solo, the others followed and discovered him in a weakened state. Izutsumi inquired if Marcel could restore them with her magic, but Marcel explained that their bodies were too depleted for immediate magical healing, which could prove fatal. She recommended gradually nourishing them back to health, suggesting a return to the water fountain to provide easily digestible sustenance. Frustrated by another delay, Izutsumi declared her intent to eliminate the succubus herself, but Chilchuk warned that succubi could not be defeated through physical combat. They adopt a guise so perfectly aligned with an individual's ideal attraction that merely glancing at them renders one immobile, Chilchuk explained, emphasizing the literal danger of their allure. This is precisely why attempting to hunt succubi alone is folly. Despite this, Izutsumi dismissed the concern, claiming her lack of specific attractions would shield her. Chilchuk countered that their influence transcends conscious preference, tapping into the most profound, unrecognized desires. He sternly advised that resistance was futile. Undeterred, Izutsumi departed. Throughout her existence, she had been this very body, showcased and passed from owner to owner in a grotesque display of human curiosity. Reflecting on Chilchuk's assertions, she bristled with resentment questioning his presumption of understanding her past. Was sporadic feeding within a cage what he considered being raised? Ultimately, it was Soro's father who acquired her, with Maizuru instilling in her a semblance of etiquette, a gesture for which Izutsumi could muster no appreciation. Izutsumi pressed on in her search, latching onto a sweet aroma she assumed was left by the succubus. 
She noted the intertwining of old and new trails of scent. Reflecting on her adversary's characteristics, namely their ability to manifest as an attractive figure leading to a mobilization, Izutsumi strategized to remain concealed, approaching stealthily to eliminate the succubus before it could morph uncertain of their true appearance prior to transformation, Izutsumi speculated they must rely on their shape-shifting ability to prey, suggesting their genuine form might be frail and unattractive. As her search progressed, Izutsumi thought she heard Chilchuk's voice, puzzling over their activities. She reminded herself that safety supposedly lay in numbers. Yet, as she tracked the scent further, realizing multiple succubi might be involved, Izutsumi deduced their keen awareness of her presence, acknowledging their cautious and persistent nature. Izutsumi cautiously approached Chilchuk and Marcel, only to be met with the sight of their drained forms. Worried she arrived too late, she quickly assessed their condition and inquired about what had transpired. Marcel recounted a prior discussion where Chilchuk expressed frustration with Izutsumi's tendency to act independently, acknowledging the difficult experiences she must have faced. Chilchuk, detecting a sweet aroma, warned Marcel, suspecting a succubus's presence. He stressed the importance of readiness, explaining the paralyzing effect of the succubus's gaze and devising a strategy for mutual protection. The eerie sound of laughter preceded the appearance of a female halfling illusion, briefly ensnaring Chilchuk. Marcel's swift reaction neutralized the threat, prompting a check on Chilchuk's well-being, which was met with his emotional reaction to the illusion's demise. Preparing for more encounters, they spotted several more succubi lurking outside. Chilchuk insisted on a calm approach, proposing they replicate their defensive tactic. As they braced for another wave of attacks, Marcel's strikes proved effective. Observing a pattern in the succubi's appearances, Marcel questioned if they resembled Chilchuk's wife, a remark that prompted a stern rebuke from Chilchuk, asking her to refrain from mentioning his wife. As they were managing the situation, Marcel observed that they seemed capable of handling all the succubi. Suddenly, their attention was diverted by the appearance of an elf on horseback. Marcel expressed surprise, while Chilchuk, assessing the figure's appearance, criticized Marcel's supposed taste as appalling, which led him to burst out laughing. Amidst Chilchuk's distraction, the succubi drew closer to him. Meanwhile, the elf, distinguished by an eye patch, affectionately addressed Marcel as princess, leaving her startled. To be honest, I'm not even sure if the succubus is a guy or girl since this manga keeps on tricking me. Anyway, I'll use he for now mirroring the manga's tendency to portray male elves with a certain femininity, reminiscent of figures like the Mad Sorcerer and Captain Mizern. The elf expressed disbelief at Marcel's escape from the castle once more, pondering over the appropriate course of action before gracefully taking her hand and placing a kiss upon it, suggesting a return. Marcel concluded her explanation about their predicament, and urgently advised Izutsumi to leave and seek assistance, as facing such a vast number of succubi alone would be futile. She emphasized the dire consequences should they all perish in the dungeon, rendering revival impossible, and suggested seeking help, possibly from those who had camped nearby. Izutsumi, skeptical of the existence of any survivors and frustrated with the situation, recalled Chilchuk's earlier suggestion to meet the mad sorcerer on her own for a quicker resolution. She lamented her decision not to pursue that path, convinced she had never needed the group's assistance. Asserting her independence, Izutsumi resolved not to seek help, despite the uncertainty surrounding the number of remaining foes. Confident in her abilities and dismissing the succubi as weak for their reliance on numbers, she was determined to confront them alone, believing herself more than capable of overcoming the challenge. Eager for confrontation, Izutsumi braced herself to battle the succubi, taunting them to advance more quickly. She believed that avoiding direct eye contact was the key to victory, confident in her ability to triumph even with her eyes shut, given the predictability of their attack strategy. However, an unexpected figure emerged from the shadows, catching Izutsumi off guard and leading her to regretfully glance at it. Initially convinced the enemy had erred in their form, not aligning with her preferences, 
Her attention was piqued when the succubus addressed her familiarly, noting her growth. This remark startled Azutsumi, leading her to question the reason behind her reaction. As the figure approached for a closer examination, Izatsumi was taken aback to recognize the woman as her mother, despite lacking any recollection of her and feeling an inexplicable joy. Yet, recognizing the threat, she instinctively attacked, piercing her in the chest and retreating. Izatsumi pondered why the creature didn't perish as expected, suspecting her resilience might stem from a mingling of her essence with that of a monster. Her battle escalated as additional succubi, mimicking her mother's form, swarmed her. Despite their numbers, Izatsumi maintained her composure, systematically eliminating each one. She noted their fragility but identified their needles as a significant hazard, speculating on their role in extracting vital essence. The sensation of their fluids burning her skin prompted her to question the nature of their attack. Izatsumi found herself unexpectedly confronted by another adversary, poised for an attack. This new enemy, also armed with a needle, took her by surprise, yet she swiftly responded with a powerful kick to its jaw, questioning whether it was another variant of a succubus. As additional succubi resembling her mother emerged, Izatsumi sought an escape, commandeering a winged statue. The succubi fixed their gaze on her, and though she deemed each individually weak, their numbers posed a significant threat of overpowering her. Izatsumi contemplated a strategy to eliminate them simultaneously. The revelation of the succubi's wings drew Izatsumi's attention, their newfound mobility allowing them to close in on her. This development resulted in Izatsumi losing her balance and falling into a fountain, where she attempted to remain concealed underwater. The succubi's attempts to reach her intensified her predicament, leading her to realize the danger of surfacing. Fortuitously, she discovered a creature in the water, which she used to distract her assailants. Reflecting on her situation, Izatsumi lamented the unfortunate turn of events, regretting not having chosen to flee earlier. Unable to hold her breath any longer, Izatsumi surfaced for air, only to discover the succubi were preoccupied with the creature she had thrown at them. Observing their tender care for the creature sparked an idea in her mind. Realizing their concern for these beings, Izatsumi hatched a plan, capturing several more creatures from the fountain to use as a diversion. By continuously tossing these creatures out, she watched as the succubi scattered one after another to attend to each rescue, leaving Izatsumi alone. Pleased with the unexpected success of her strategy, she cautiously inspected the hallway to confirm their departure. Though puzzled by the turn of events, she was relieved to have evaded the immediate threat. However, she was now faced with addressing the remainder of her predicament. It was then that she detected the sound of someone approaching. She encountered the elf wearing an eye patch, now swollen, accompanied by halflings, all seemingly in search of something by the fountain. Seizing the opportunity, Izatsumi prepared to confront them, realizing they were succubi who had drained the other's vital essence. Reflecting on their condition, she scornfully remarked on Marcel's questionable preferences, speculating that reintroducing the vital essence might reverse their deteriorated state. Izatsumi self-proclaimed her ingenuity, considering the possibility of restoring them to their original form. Izatsumi realized that the succubi had enchanted Marcel, Chilchuk, and herself. She speculated whether an attempt was made to charm the monstrous aspect within her though it proved ineffective. She hypothesized that the immunity to the succubus resembling her mother wasn't due to a lack of humanity, but rather because she possessed two hearts, suggesting that while one could be ensnared by charm, the other remained unaffected. This revelation led her to reflect on her solitude, recognizing that she wasn't entirely alone after all. Admiring the creature, she praised the discerning taste of her monstrous side. Upon attacking the succubi, Izatsumi observed a white, milk-like substance emanating from them, contemplating its consumption but opting to boil it first for safety. Utilizing Senshi's pot, she collected and boiled the liquid, noting its reduction. Recalling the importance of calories in food, she decided to sweeten the concoction with sugar, 
despite her uncertainty about the substance she was using. She diligently stirred the mixture into the milk, eventually creating what was dubbed succubus hot milk. Preparing a spot on the ground with some cloth, Izutsumi methodically placed each of her companions' bodies side by side. She then proceeded to cool the milk before attempting to feed it to Layos with a spoon. Faced with the challenge of his clenched mouth, she resorted to pinching his nose, prompting him to involuntarily open his mouth and allowing him to ingest the milk. Observing Layos gradually regaining his usual demeanor, Izatsumi proceeded to administer the same treatment to the rest of her companions. She gently fed Marcel the milk, taking the time to clean her face afterward, followed by Chilchuk and Senshi, the process leaving her noticeably fatigued. Marcel was the first to awaken, urging Layos to do the same while informing him of their victory over the succubi. Initially disoriented, Layos soon gathered his bearings and stood, both of them pondering who had vanquished their foes. Marcel credited Izutsumi for their rescue, noting her absence upon awakening. Chilchuk speculated if his earlier words had driven Izutsumi away, suggesting they search for her, though Marcel cautioned against rash actions. Layos then spotted Izutsumi, finding her asleep atop the winged statue, prompting Chilchuk to marvel at her nonchalance. Layos reassured him, expressing confidence in Izutsumi's awareness of her independence yet recognizing the importance of her presence to the group, assuring that all would be well. Chilchuk, exiting the scene, insisted his concern was unwarranted. While examining the water, Layos spotted a succubus larva and deduced that the fountain served as their breeding ground. He explained that succubi extract the vital essences, essentially the blood and bodily fluids of animals converting it into a milk-like substance internally to nourish their larvae. These creatures, known as succubus mosquitoes, belong to a unique insect species that feeds its offspring milk. Lyos elaborated on their similarity to familiar mosquitoes, noting that succubi produce an anesthetic in their saliva during blood sucking. This anesthetic induces a temporary feeling of pleasure in their victims, followed by intense itching once the effect dissipates leading people to develop repellents and incenses against them. Chilchuk expressed his astonishment, having previously thought succubi to be demonic entities rather than mere insects. Marcel clarified that they are indeed considered succubus demons, from which the mythological monsters derive their name. Lyos admitted his limited knowledge about the demonic variants of succubi, suggesting that such beings might merely be legendary figures elaborated upon over generations. He found it intriguing that creatures resembling these myths subsequently appeared, prompting him to ponder the origins of monsters, which he finds to be fascinating entities. Shifting the conversation, Marcel inquired about the appearance of the succubi they encountered, curious whether they resembled anyone familiar and if they could even be considered human. Lyos, reflecting on this, recalled an important detail he needed to share with Marcel about a potential interaction he had with the winged lion during his separation from the group. Rewinding to the midst of the confrontation with the succubi, we delve into what exactly Lyos was up to during his solitary departure. He inspected their provisions, only to realize they were depleted of milk. He mused over the folklore suggesting that leaving milk beside one's pillow could deter succubi by offering them an alternative to attacking humans. However, he acknowledged that this myth pertained to the demonic incarnation of succubi, doubting its relevance to their current predicament. Suddenly, Layos was taken aback by the presence of someone behind him. Upon turning, he was greeted by the figure of Marcel, leading him to apologize for his momentary absence mentioning their lack of milk. His explanation was cut short as the figure resembling Marcel leaned in for a kiss. Instantly, Layoz's defensive instincts kicked in, grasping her neck with the realization that this was not her, suspecting a shape-shifting succubus instead. Puzzled by the choice of Marcel's appearance, he foresaw the potential for a grave misunderstanding, eager to resolve the situation discreetly. The doppelganger countered, Suggesting that were she a succubus, Layos would already be ensnared by her spell. This argument seemed logical to Layos, prompting him to release his hold, 
pondering the implications of her claim. Lyos inquired why Marcel was by herself and inquired about the whereabouts of their companions. Lowering her eyes, the figure resembling Marcel confessed she harbored a secret. Gradually, she morphed into a different entity, revealing her true monstrous identity, much to Lyos's astonishment. She disclosed that her bite could transform others into monsters, proposing that Lyos join her in this altered state to resolve their predicament without causing harm to Farlin. She insinuated that Lyos harbored desires of transcending his human form. Concerned, Lyos questioned the fate of their comrades, to which the creature, assuming Marcel's appearance, reassured him that she had preemptively bitten the others. Lyos expressed a sense of relief at this revelation. The creature then drew closer, delicately licking Lyos's cheek. Suddenly, a lion appeared in front of him, derisively questioning his intelligence. Lyos was bewildered and began searching for Marcel. The winged lion clarified that they were currently navigating his dream, explaining that Lyos had succumbed to a succubus's bite and fallen unconscious. Lyos entertained the notion of Marcel being his succubus. The winged lion urged him not to be ensnared by such distractions, highlighting the urgency of his mission. Upon Lyos's inquiry about his identity, the lion expressed regret for not introducing himself earlier, mentioning that although he lacks a true name or form, he is commonly referred to as the winged lion. This revelation took Lyos by surprise. The winged lion explained that their direct communication was facilitated by Lyos's proximity to the dungeon's deepest reaches, via the perception of his diminutive ally, Kin Su Kate. Aware of Lyos's objective to vanquish Thistle, the mad sorcerer, the lion expressed a desire to aid in this endeavor. Nonetheless, he emphasized the need for Lyos to cultivate a heightened sense of awareness and accept his role as the kingdom's savior. This declaration left Lyos in astonishment, questioning why he was chosen for such a monumental responsibility. The winged lion disclosed that it was the architect behind the dungeon and its inhabitants, all constructed at Thistle's behest to safeguard the kingdom and its populace. After coexisting with both the residents and the monsters for a millennium, he developed a profound affection for them. Despite numerous adventurers entering the dungeon in pursuit of wealth, leaving trails of destruction among the monsters and the spirits of the residents, the winged lion recognized Lyos as an exception. Lyos acknowledged his own role in the violence, admitting to having killed some creatures as well. The winged lion conceded this point but distinguished Lyos's actions from those of other adventurers. He commended Lyos for demonstrating compassion towards the monsters by ensuring their sacrifices were not in vain, an act of respect and appreciation for their existence. The lion revealed that a call had been made for Lyos, expressing his desire to bequeath the stewardship of the nation, its people, and the monsters entirely to Lyos's care. Faced with such a proposition, Lyos found himself at a loss for words, prompting the winged lion to probe the root of his hesitation. To address this, the lion presented Lyos with a vision of the nation under his rule, aiming to illustrate the potential impact of his acceptance as its king. Awakened by his sister Farlin, Lyos was informed that breakfast was ready, prompting him to get up. He observed that Farlin's lower body appeared normal again, which led him to question his surroundings pondering if he was dreaming. The winged lion clarified that they were experiencing a hypothetical scenario built upon the foundation of his dream. As Lyos exited his room, various creatures extended their morning greetings, confusing him. The winged lion explained that these beings were his subjects. A woman approached Lyos to inquire about his omelette preference for breakfast, offering choices such as cockatrice, basilisk, or wyvern. Upon choosing wyvern, the woman indicated she would notify Senshi of his decision. Marcel then approached, mentioning a slew of tasks awaiting his attention, including a proposal to establish a shopping district on the third level. However, Farlin interceded, reminding them that business discussions were prohibited during meal times. While they proceeded with the meal preparations, the winged lion observed Marcel's significant involvement in the dungeon's planning and commended her leadership skills. 
He suggested that delegating responsibilities could unveil more opportunities, recognizing Marcel's latent potential to curate a remarkable dungeon. Gathered at the dining table with individuals and orcs encountered throughout his adventure, they savored the meal, with Senshi offering additional servings. Amidst the lively atmosphere, Laios grappled with disbelief at the scene unfolding before him. Marcel inquired about the well-being of the direwolf cubs born the previous day, questioning Laios's distant demeanor. Farlin, observing her brother's exhaustion, recommended he take a leisurely day to explore the town, assuring him that she and Marcel would handle the day-to-day -day affairs, prompting him to leave. Laios left with a tinge of regret for missing out on the wyvern omelette. Venturing into the town, Laios discovered a lively marketplace teeming with various creatures and merchants. He marveled at the bustling crowd, recognizing some individuals from the dungeon, though noting many appeared to have originated from the surface. The winged lion explained that these were individuals who resonated with Laios's vision. As he continued to observe, Laios grew intrigued by the interactions between humans, orcs, and monsters, keen to understand the dynamics of their coexistence. Laios was astounded to discover the town's location within the dungeon, a creation attributed to him by the winged lion. According to the lion, Laios had prohibited adventurers from exploring the area and, by domesticating non-aggressive monsters for agriculture, sustained the local economy. Questioning the feasibility of benign monsters, Laios expressed his astonishment, leading the winged lion to clarify that Thistle had commanded the monsters not to harm the inhabitants of his domain, demonstrating that the dungeon could align with the desires of its sovereign. The lion described himself as merely power, capable of fulfilling the dungeon lord's wishes. Interrupted by someone calling his name, Laios was presented with a freshly picked baromet, encouraged to taste it. Additionally, he received various items to deliver to Senshi, prompting Laios to ponder if they pertained to an embryo. He noted the limitations of experiencing flavors in a dream. The winged lion, expressing a desire to share in the taste, was disappointed when the attempt to share the food with him proved futile, having hoped to savor the sensation of eating after a considerable hiatus. Laios queried if the winged lion abstained from eating. The lion confessed that, being confined, consumption of food wasn't a necessity for him. Yet, observing his companions relishing their meals stirred a longing within him, as they indulged in delectable fare daily. Laios, curious about the lion's confinement, learned it was near Thistle's abode, the site of the lion's ceiling. The lion proposed using Kensuke to lead Laios there, suggesting that should a covert entry be feasible, Laios might manage to liberate him thereby temporarily containing his power. Their discussion was interrupted by nearby unrest, identified by the lion as the work of a poacher. He elaborated on the kingdom's reliance on mandrakes, unicorns, treasure bugs, succubi, and other valuable monsters, which, while beneficial, also attracted adventurers. Given these creatures' non-aggressive nature towards humans, they found themselves defenseless against such threats. Laios pondered the predicament, considering whether to allow these creatures to retaliate for self-protection or to enhance security measures to deter intruders. Nonetheless, he concluded that neither solution was satisfactory. Laios speculated whether the mad sorcerer encountered similar dilemmas. Initially, the sorcerer likely endeavored to shield the kingdom's inhabitants, but gradually morphed into the entity known today while attempting to resolve numerous minor issues. The lion acknowledged the realm's significant distance from being a utopia, highlighting the widespread poverty and strife. Laios reflected on these challenges, recognizing the shared existence of living beings within the same world, yet lamented the persistent cycle of violence. The situation's complexity frustrated him, leading him to question the feasibility of fostering change, possibly through utilizing monsters as a food source as a step towards realizing a harmonious coexistence. Envisioning a world where harmony with monsters was attainable appealed greatly to Laios. The lion, finding Laios's perspective intriguing, expressed his fondness for him, inquiring if Laios's doubts had been alleviated. 
Lyos affirmed his desire to witness the potential future of such a world, contemplating the myriad of possibilities that lay ahead. Suddenly, Lyos found himself unexpectedly tasting something sweet, prompting a curious look. The winged lion, noticing his expression, inquired about it. Lyos described the sudden emergence of a delightful sweetness in his mouth. The lion interpreted this as a sign their shared experience was drawing to a close, with Lyos nearing awakening. He warned that Lyos might forget most of the dream's details, yet implored him to hold on to the emotions felt during their encounter, promising to await Lyos's actions. He also cautioned him to be wary of the canaries before Lyos felt as if he were plunging into darkness. Returning to reality, Chilchuk questioned Lyos about his dialogue with the winged lion. Lyos confessed his memory was hazy, though he vaguely recalled the lion promising guidance through his words and monitoring them via Kinsuke's body. Marcel confirmed the winged lion's influence in opening a door for them. When probed for additional recollections, Lyos affirmed the dream's enjoyment stood out vividly, emphasizing the lack of resistance to consuming monsters. He reminisced about wyvern omelets and the opportunity to taste fresh baromats, highlighting the joyous atmosphere of his dream. Chilchuk remarked that such experiences resemble the unsettling dreams often associated with illness. Lyos acknowledged that, being a dream, he was unable to actually consume any food, leaving him feeling quite famished now. Senshi proposed that their hunger might stem from the incomplete replenishment of their vital essence. To address this, Senshi prepared a meal using a succubus larva. He decapitated it, inserted a chopstick through a rear opening to remove the digestive system, and then stripped away the shell. After applying salt to the larva to draw out moisture, he chopped up vegetables and cooked them alongside the larva. Following their cooking, he introduced flour and succubus milk to the mix, seasoned it, and let it simmer briefly. Senshi then meticulously removed the membrane from a bicorn brain, allowing it to simmer momentarily. Once the mixture in the pot had thickened, he served it atop cooked rice, garnished with shredded cheese and bicorn brain, and covered it to let the dish reach the desired temperature. The resulting delicacy was dubbed succubus and bicorn brain doria. The dish appeared delectable, sparking excitement in Lyos, especially since he had never sampled larva before. Upon tasting it, he described the texture as springy and the flavor reminiscent of milk, attributing this characteristic to the larvae being nurtured on their mother's milk. Senshi then presented the dish to Marcel and Chilchuk, both of whom were initially hesitant about the unconventional meal. Despite their reservations, they gave it a try, and to their surprise, Marcel found the brain's flavor to be quite subtle. She rationalized that considering it akin to milk diminished its peculiarity. Lyos, puzzled, inquired about milk, to which Marcel explained it refers to fish testicles, often incorporated into soups. Lyos found it ironic that Marcel, who was apprehensive about consuming larvae and brains, was accepting of milk, which he personally found more objectionable. Feeling satiated, Lyos suggested that Azutsumi could finish the leftovers once she awoke, though it was evident she was feigning sleep to evade the meal. Recalling a final piece of advice from the winged lion, Lyos shared it, despite not fully grasping its significance. The lion had cautioned, beware of the canaries, leaving Lyos to ponder the warning's underlying meaning. In the subsequent chapter, we delve into Cabru's past, exploring his life after the loss of his hometown and his adoption by the elves. Found injured, a young Cabru was tenderly nourished by an elf who demonstrated immense patience and care towards him. Despite Cabru's protest that he no longer felt any pain and his eagerness to return to sword training, the elf maintained that he needed further rest and recuperation. Cabru expressed his desire to venture into dungeons, motivated by a determination to prevent the tragedy that befell his hometown from recurring. He voiced his ambition to become as formidable as his elven caretaker. This declaration prompted the elf to embrace Cabru tightly, expressing her concern over the myriad dangers of dungeons, including the threats posed by monsters, traps, and the malevolence of others. Confessing the mere thought of such perils caused her distress. 
The elf suggested that staying with her indefinitely would be ideal, highlighting the comfort, warmth, and availability of cake in their abode. She offered to educate him on various subjects, excluding the daunting aspects of dungeons, to spare him from their horrors. Yet, Cabru, extricating himself from her embrace, insisted on facing the reality of dungeons, determined to explore them regardless of whether she imparted any knowledge to him. His resolve brought the elf to tears, understanding his determination. She then promised him rigorous sword training, hoping it might deter his ambitions. As training commenced, Cobru faced such grueling challenges that he felt on the brink of death. When he eventually ventured into a dungeon, he encountered not only traps, monsters, and hostility, but also endured extreme hunger and cold. Despite these hardships, and reminiscing about the room where he could indulge in endless cake, Cabru never once desired to return to that haven of comfort. In the current moment, Cabru came to the realization that he and Captain Mizern had plummeted down the hole. He pondered the events that transpired subsequently in Mizern's whereabouts, finding it peculiar that despite the considerable fall, he sustained no injuries. He was equally intrigued to discover a walking mushroom attached to his leg. Mizern then made his presence known, acknowledging Cabru's return to consciousness. With only a knife as his weapon, Cabru contemplated his ability to approach Mizern while evading potential teleportation spells. Mizern mentioned that the mad sorcerer seemed to have landed in a different location and suggested they proceed. This proposal left Cabru baffled, curious about Mizern's nonchalant demeanor and whether this implied Mizern intended to spare his life. Cabru speculated on the reasons Mizern would include him in his plans, concluding that regardless of Mizern's intentions, this situation presented an opportune moment. Cabru contemplated sabotaging the Canary Squad's efforts to dominate the dungeon and aim to uncover the secrets that the long-lived races concealed, all while acknowledging Mizern as the captain of the Canaries. Cabru contemplated the necessity of understanding Mizern's character and identifying an approach to ingratiate himself with him. Noting that the Canary Squad primarily consisted of individuals engaged in forbidden magics or offspring of nobility, showcased as a gesture of fealty to the nation, he recognized the distinct marking of a notch in the ears of criminal members. Given Mizern's status as a captain and the conspicuous absence of half of both ears, Cabru deduced he likely hailed from a prominent family. Estimating Mizern's age to be around 180 and observing his lack of a discernible accent, Cabru surmised his origins were in the central region. However, Mizern's personality failed to pique Cabru's interest significantly. Absorbed in his thoughts, Cabru was caught off guard when Mizern halted suddenly, alerting him to an imminent threat. Mizern had spotted a shapeshifter, yet to detect their presence, and proposed a preemptive strike. As Mizern made contact with the ground, Cabru found himself unexpectedly teleported directly in front of the shapeshifter, catching both him and the creature off guard. Mizern acknowledged his mizaim, while Cabru criticized the tactic of employing individuals as improvised projectiles. Upon the creature's growl and the subsequent rustling of leaves, Mizern immediately recognized the predicament they faced. Shapeshifters, he explained, craft duplicates by mining the memories of those nearby, producing precise replicas. Cabru was both astonished and somewhat let down upon confronting his own duplicate, deducing the shapeshifter's main body had escaped, implying the doubles would eventually dissipate. Cabru mused that Mizern seemingly lacked any genuine interest in him, based on the unremarkable duplicate's characteristics. Realizing the futility of remaining on high alert, Cabru relaxed his guard. Cabru's attention was drawn to the shapeshifter consuming something. Investigating further among the fallen leaves, he discovered it was one of the pixies used by the canaries for communication, possibly having followed them into the depths. Mizern then utilized the injured pixie to establish contact with Pat Dole, who expressed her relief upon learning of his safety. Inquiring about his location and condition, Mizern described their chilly surroundings and the pixie's critical state, hinting at its imminent death. Pat Dole surmised they were below the sixth floor, noting the pit's self-reparation, 
which would hinder rescue efforts. Her conversation paused as she pondered the fate of the individual responsible for Ms. Cern's fall, but Kao Bru interjected, indicating his continuous presence, despite the obvious duplicate's existence nearby. Pat Dole expressed her displeasure by labeling Kabru a villain. The pixie, bothered by the loudness of her voice, emphasized the urgency of their situation, dismissing the need for further reprimands. Addressing Kabru, the pixie conveyed a significant request on behalf of Pat Dole. Given the anticipated week-long delay before initiating a rescue operation for the captain, she implored Kabru to attend to Ms. Cern's daily necessities, placing particular emphasis on ensuring he received three meals a day. She promised that fulfilling this duty would mitigate the repercussions of the current predicament. Nonetheless, she cautioned that should any harm befall the captain under his watch, they would retaliate against his allies as a form of retribution. Shortly thereafter, the Pixie ceased to function. Faced with the daunting task of catering to the captain's nutritional needs for an entire week, Cabru felt overwhelmed especially given his lack of culinary experience. He was uncertain about procuring food supplies and was struck by the realization of his predicament, recalling Layoza's adaptive survival methods. Determined to avoid a similar fate, he expressed a strong aversion to becoming like Layoz, preferring any alternative to that outcome. With no choice left, Cabru detached the walking mushroom from his foot and skewered it on a stick. He recalled Layo's mentioning that the first monster they consumed was a walking mushroom, leading him to surmise it was safe to eat. Reluctantly, he acknowledged that Layo's knowledge was crucial for their survival. As he cooked the mushroom, it began to sizzle and release juices, an appearance Cabru found unappetizing. His desire to eat the mushroom remained absent. Cabru inquired if Captain Mizern possessed abilities to neutralize poison or perform resurrection spells, to which Mizern affirmed. Comforted by this assurance, Cabru steeled himself to confront the dungeon's enigmas, though with evident reluctance, he sampled the mushroom. He found its flavor lacking, with a texture both tough and spongy, and the release of liquid with each chew only added to his disdain. Nonetheless, he managed to swallow it, then reassured the captain of its edibility, encouraging him to try it despite Misern's declared lack of appetite. Misern, acquiescing to taste it, remarked on its toughness, a sentiment Cabru echoed. Together, they consumed the mushroom, sharing the meager fare in their precarious situation. Cabru realized sustaining themselves for an entire week under such conditions was implausible. He understood the necessity of finding both potable water and an alternative food source, considering even moss or rats as preferable to their current diet. He expressed a desire to locate sustenance beyond monsters. Curious about their miraculous survival from the fall, Cabru inquired with the captain, who explained his use of teleportation to mitigate their descent. By teleporting to the identical spot in a vertically inverted posture, he momentarily reversed their downward momentum. While pondering this explanation, Cabru drifted into sleep, dreaming of Layo's proclaiming victory over the dungeon's lord, claiming ownership over everything. Cabru felt relieved his trust was well-placed, anticipating that the dungeon's long-concealed secrets by the elder races would soon be unveiled. However, Layo's shared plans divergent from Cabru's expectations, expressing a desire to establish a monster ranch and farm, envisioning a kingdom ruled by monsters. This revelation stunned Cabru, especially Layoza's indifference towards humans and the dungeon's mysteries. Layoza's chosen path, driven by a preference for consuming monsters indefinitely, was starkly different from Cabru's aspirations. Struggling to grasp the reality of his dream, Cabru accused Layoza of being a formidable adversary to humanity, only to be abruptly awakened by a blow to the face. Disoriented, he listened as Captain Mizern clarified he had been dreaming, likely experiencing a nightmare. Cabru wondered when he had drifted off to sleep, recalling a nightmare but unable to remember the details due to the sudden awakening. Mizern informed him that he had been asleep for approximately five hours, prompting Cabru to offer to keep watch so Mizern could rest. However, Mizern declined, claiming he wasn't tired, 
which led Kaobru to admire his resilience. Suggesting they scout the area for a water source, the pair explored their surroundings and stumbled upon a relatively open space, where Kaobru spotted a sleeping bag, potentially left behind by adventurers who met their demise in the dungeon. Recognizing the names inscribed on it, Kaobru speculated about its origins and whether it was linked to a tragic event involving La Yosa's younger sister. He proposed they make temporary use of the sleeping bag, but upon turning to Mizern, he observed the captain struggling to breathe before collapsing. This sudden incapacitation left Cabru in shock, particularly when he discovered that his own body had unexpectedly become immobile, leaving them unable to ascertain the cause of their affliction. Prompted by urgency, Cabru sought a place for concealment, his attention captured by the sound of running water. Upon investigation, they discovered a water source, which, along with a sleeping bag and a suitable hiding spot, seemed eerily convenient, unsettling Cabru. After assisting the captain to rest, Mizern suggested that the dungeon had materialized these provisions in response to Cabru's desires, cautioning him against wishing too fervently. Cabru assessed Mizern's condition, noting symptoms that suggested a depletion of mana, which struck him as peculiar for a magician of his caliber. Given the task he was charged with, Cabru suspected the captain's issues were more complex. Inquiring about Masern's health, he assured that understanding the problem would enable him to provide appropriate care. Masern, acknowledging Cabru's curiosity, warned such a trait could prove dangerous within the dungeon's confines. Yet, Cabru's persistence led Masern to disclose his past as a dungeon lord, paralleling the mad sorcerer's history. Mizern recounted a mission from 40 years prior, involving a dungeon near a port town perceived as minimally threatening. However, contrary to expectations, the dungeon claimed numerous members of their squad, echoing the calamity of Utaya, though on a smaller scale. Intrigued, Cabru inquired about Mizern's fate, to which he responded with a grim revelation. He was the sole survivor, a remnant of the dungeon's feast. Captain Mizern divulged the complexities surrounding a past expedition to a dungeon and the subsequent transformation of his body. Cabru appreciated Mizern's willingness to share his story, yet he found the narrative overly intricate. Mizern recounted an assignment involving a canary squad that included himself back when he was merely a rank-and-file member. The squad featured a diverse array of characters such as Fungil, the Swift, Coyote, the Clairvoyant, Mike Pa, Sita, with keen hearing, Eugene, Missilril, and the twins. Cabru, overwhelmed by the multitude of characters, requested a simplified recounting, boiling it down to Mizern and his comrades. While examining the equipment they had gathered, Cabru contemplated the grave implications of becoming a dungeon lord as described by Mizern. Determined to ensure the story was accurately documented, he acknowledged the complexity of Masern's account and his own need for clarity. With a week until expected assistance, Cabru saw an opportunity to unravel the story's intricacies. Questioning Masern's ability to sleep, he learned that Mizern required medication for rest. Mizern offered to teach Cabru a sleep spell, but Cabru declined, probing further about Masern's relaxation methods. Despite Masern's skepticism, Cabru encouraged him to attempt natural rest adjusting his blanket and assisting with his boots to create a more comfortable environment for sleep. Although Captain Mizern dismissed the efforts as futile, Cabru noticed his feet were cold and his muscles stiff. He suggested massaging them to enhance circulation, a notion Mizern doubted would induce sleep. Contrary to Mizern's expectations, the effort proved effective and he fell asleep. Cabru reflected on the unlikely scenario of performing such a task for Layos and his companions, finding it difficult to reconcile with his prior experiences. Observing Mizern in repose, Cabru contemplated the captain's past, envisioning him with intact ears and silver eyes, emanating the demeanor of a distinguished young man from a reputable family. Despite his noble origins, Mizern remained humble and was evidently cherished by his squad. The transformation he underwent, emerging as someone detached from desires, including those essential for survival, marked a profound change. 
This alteration left him dependent on others for basic needs, as he lacked even the fundamental cravings for sustenance or rest. Cabru pondered the implications of Masern's condition, particularly how it affected his basic physiological needs. Abruptly waking Mizern, Cabru inquired about his last visit to the restroom. Despite Mizern expressing no immediate need, Cabru insisted on addressing this necessity, prioritizing Mizern's well-being amidst their challenging circumstances. Rather than referring to his actions as caring for Captain Mizern, Cabru likened his role to that of a nurse. Three days post their descent, Cabru procured a sheep. However, during their expedition, Mizern depleted his mana reserves and lost consciousness. While attempting to gather the sheep ensnared in a tree, they found themselves encircled by wolves. Cabru braced for the worst, but they miraculously evaded the wolves through the use of teleportation magic. Afterwards, Cabru contemplated offering Mizern a pleasant meal, yet Mizern's absence of desires complicated this intention, eliminating even the basic preference for food. Delving back into Mizern's history, Cabru recounted an encounter with a magical mirror deep within the dungeon, capable of ensnaring the hearts of those who viewed it by reflecting their innermost desires. Mizern, typically indifferent to such enchantments, was unexpectedly captivated by a vision of his older brother dining with the person Mizern cherished. This revelation struck Mizern deeply, highlighting a love opportunity missed due to his commitment to the Canary Squad in place of his brother. Cabru recognized the manipulation inherent in exploiting unrequited love narratives, a tactic effective across all races. In a state of fury, Mizern destroyed the mirror, from which emerged a goat that proposed an alternate reality where Mizern had not enlisted with the Canaries, implying a life spent with his beloved was still attainable. Upon contact with the goat, Mizern harbored a newfound yearning for the life he had forsaken by joining the Canaries. Upon awakening, Captain Mizern was greeted by Cabru, who recounted his attempt at preparing the sheep they had acquired, drawing upon childhood memories for guidance. However, he observed notable discrepancies in the creature's anatomy compared to typical sheep, encountering difficulty with the unfamiliar internal organs and unexpectedly soft bones complicating the separation of edible parts. Mizern discerned Cabru's intention to create a lamb stew. A dish Cabru mentioned was a favorite of his mother's, though he admitted to lacking several essential ingredients. Cabru served the stew, expressing his anticipation for the meal, reminiscent of comfort food he hadn't savored in some time. Offering a portion to Mizern with the hope he would enjoy the flavor, they both embarked on tasting the stew. Surprisingly, they discovered it bore a distinct resemblance to crab in taste. For days into their ordeal, Cabru acknowledged the perplexity of their situation, noting his typically reliable sense of direction seemed to falter, leading them to increasingly unfamiliar locales the more they attempted to retrace their steps. He expressed concern over whether the rescue team would manage to locate them amidst their constant movement. Captain Mizern reassured him that Flecky's familiar would find them, assuming it wasn't preyed upon by dungeon denizens. Cabru pondered which scenario posed a greater risk, the familiar being consumed by monsters or facing such a fate themselves. In an effort to elude an aggressive creature, they inadvertently stumbled through a circle of changeling mushrooms, which impacted their pursuer and allowed Mizern an opportunity to counterattack, striking it on the head. Mizern's attempt to dispatch the creature into a wall via teleportation missed its mark, leaving its return uncertain and beyond their control, prompting a decision to press forward. Cabru observed that no matter their chosen path, their surroundings grew increasingly bewildering. As Mizern struggled to his feet and inspected their environment, he discovered and activated a hidden passageway, theorizing the presence of secret routes in such a meticulously designed area. Cabru speculated that Mizern's acute navigational instincts might be a lingering attribute from his tenure as a dungeon lord. In a chapter detailing Captain Mizern's past, a transformative encounter with a goat, embodying the dungeon lord's ability to fulfill desires, is recounted. Mizern found himself in a village reminiscent of his hometown, where he led an idyllic existence surrounded by friends and loved ones, 
enjoying unparalleled contentment within the dungeon's confines. Yet, as he endeavored to address the emerging issues within his domain, the dungeon's conditions worsened, with monsters becoming increasingly prevalent and its layout more labyrinthine. The goat, drawing strength from each wish it granted Mizern, inadvertently caused his companions to vanish one by one, and Mizern perceived his own life force diminishing. Amidst his declining health, the goat reappeared, aggressively feasting on Mizern, an act that horrified him. Despite his pleas for cessation, Mizern found himself transported to a realm inhabited by his friends, who deliberated over his fate given the depletion of his will to live, including his very desire for existence. Faced with his imminent demise, Mizern inquired about the goat's whereabouts, only to learn from the elf that the demon had vanished, lacking the sustenance required to fully empower itself. Mizern's muttered vow of vengeance caught the elf's attention, inspiring her to save him, despite the other's reservations. She reassured them of the absence of any peril. From that moment, Mizern's life became singularly focused on the pursuit of demons, a quest he undertook despite the absence of any personal desires. His existence transformed into a relentless campaign against the demonic forces that had once sought to consume him. Returning to the present, Kobru sought Captain Mizern's opinion on his rendition of Mizern's narrative, asking if he had captured the essence of it. Mizern pointed out that Kabru had inaccurately represented several nuances, to which Kabru confessed he simplified elements for easier understanding, suspecting Mizern wouldn't appreciate an elaborate exposition on elven societal structure. Kabru acknowledged his struggle with the complexity of such intricate personal dynamics. Mizern, intrigued by Kabru's use of him, surmised Kabru intended to share the tale with someone else, likely an individual nearing the dungeon's conquest. He probed further about this person's character and the motivations driving their dungeon expedition, questioning whether Kabru believed the story would deter their quest. Convinced it wouldn't, Kabru asserted the necessity of venturing deeper into the dungeon, emphasizing the dungeon's allure to those with potent desires, essentially the demon it harbors. Reflecting on the demon from Misern's past, Kabru noted its striking similarity to entities depicted in legends, suggesting a profound connection between Misern's personal adversary and the archetypal demons of folklore. In their pursuit of creating a perpetual motion machine, ancient civilizations inadvertently opened a portal to a dimension where infinity reigned. This gateway allowed them to harness boundless energy, yet it also unleashed entities from that realm into theirs. These entities, known as demons, developed an insatiable appetite for human desires. Initially weak, these beings gained strength by feasting on the desires of people, leading to the demise of those who were consumed. To curb the free passage of demons through the gate and protect the surface world, the ancients constructed dungeons as a barrier. Kabru queried if ancient magic involved rituals to summon these demons, and why such knowledge was obscured by the elves. The captain explained that awareness of demons wouldn't prevent individuals from attempting to conjure them, highlighting the peril posed by the demon's ability to fulfill any wish, particularly to those in authority. This capability could lead to catastrophic consequences. Despite reservations, the ancients continued to satiate the demons with human desires, a practice that ultimately led to their downfall. Presently, Demons employ various strategies to entice individuals into dungeons, specifically targeting those with intense desires to become dungeon lords. By fulfilling their wishes, demons provoke even greater desires. Should a demon consume sufficient desires and amass power, it is poised to breach the dungeon's confines and unleash havoc upon the world. The captain elucidated that, Paradoxically, individuals yearning for material gains such as wealth and fame are deemed less hazardous, as such commonplace desires scarcely suffice to satiate a demon's appetite. The real issue arises when someone harbors intricate aspirations akin to thistles and ascends to the role of dungeon lord. Prompted by the captain's inquiry about the individual Kabru mentioned, Kabru deliberated before revealing that this person's primary motivation was the rescue of his sister, coupled with a profound fascination with monsters. 
Cabrew expressed concern over the potential repercussions should someone of this disposition become a dungeon lord. However, his apprehension was interrupted by the captain's suggestion that preemptive measures, specifically eliminating the individual, might be necessary to avert such an outcome. Five days following their descent, they found themselves at the entrance to the area beyond the sixth floor. Cabrew struggled to open the gate, feeling the surge of magic within it upon contact. Having awakened in an elven form, Cabrew initially felt despair at the racial transformation but soon found the experience intriguing, pondering the permanence of their altered states. Captain Mizern, now in a human form, warned that if left untreated, they would eventually become covered in mushrooms, losing their identity. The solution involved eradicating all spores from their bodies to prevent the transformation into mushroom beings, leading them to bathe. During the bath, Cabrew observed the captain's notably robust physique and inquired if he had missed any spots while cleaning. Despite Masern's assurance that he had removed all spores, a mushroom sprouted on his head, prompting Cabrew to question the necessity of Masern's deception. Six days into their ordeal, the sound of flapping wings roused them from sleep. Upon opening the door, Captain Mizern was greeted by a bird delivering a scroll of teleportation which he promptly affixed to the wall before casting a spell, summoning an elf. This elf commented on Masern's unusually lustrous hair, questioning whether Cabrew had been taking care of him adequately. Soon, a disturbance was noted, stemming from Pat Dole's decision to summon all standby comrades to their location, prompting a temporary closure of the portal. Merely five minutes later, another elf materialized, expressing joy upon reuniting with Mizern. However, Cabrew interjected, eager to ensure the safety of his own friends. Consequently, Namari and Siro were presented, aligning with Cabrew's anticipation, though he surmised the rest of his group might have been preoccupied with other matters. As Mizern stepped through the teleportation scroll, a jarring sound of ringing afflicted everyone present. This disruption was identified as Lyoza's action, utilizing the bell Soro had provided to guide Azutsumi through the gate. Soro offered an apology, prompting Cabrew to scan their surroundings, querying whether others detected the sound of a distinct bell, indicating Layoz's proximity. Mizern inquired if Layoz was the individual previously mentioned by Cabrew. Urging Mizern to expedite his departure, the elf showed concern for Cabrew's next course of action. Cabrew's fascination with La Yoz originated from an inability to discern La Yoz's motivations for adventuring, given his apparent disinterest in wealth, fame, or interpersonal connections, which initially unnerved Cabrew. Discovering La Yoz's simple affection for monsters brought a sense of relief to Cabrew, yet he now harbored apprehensions. Opting against returning to the surface, Cabrew expressed a desire to delve further into the dungeon and sought another encounter with Layos. As the elves accessed the transportation scroll, Mizern elected to accompany Cabrew, leaving the elves astonished by his decision. One elf issued orders to mobilize and pursue Mizern. Cabrew was keen on a reunion, driven by a need to confront and understand his actions more thoroughly.